What's up, everybody? Welcome to SureDog.com. This is Off the Chain, the panel discussion show. I'm your host, Ant Walker. Joining me again is a very magnificent panel, but we decided to mix things up a bit. Uh, our resident stat guy, Jay, has decided to abandon us uh, to take a well-deserved vacation. So we're going to go ahead and introduce the panel. First off, we got a special guest from MMA Fighting, Jose Youngs. My man, what's up? How you feeling, bro? Uh, I'm glad to be on. I'm, I'm super unprepared, but that's how I like to roll. All off the cuff. So I'm excited for everyone to make fun of me and tell me I look like a fool. So it happens on my show over on MMA Fighting, so why not do it over on Sure Dog as well? You got to yeah. spread the hate. Spreading the hate is very important. Very always. important to spread the hate. So, uh, of course, the panel, has, as always, uh, we have the senior editor of SureDog.com, the jack-of-all-trades who's mastered them all, Mr. Ben Duffy. Ben, what's going on, my man? I'm doing great this evening, and so that we don't miss his presence too much, Jay did entrust me with his stat of the day, so I'm going to deliver it real quick. All right. The stat of the day, unsurprisingly, is 14, the number of stoppages at Bellator 225 out of 14 fights. In every single major promotion in modern MMA history, that includes UFC, Pride, Strike Force, World Extreme Cage Fighting, Dream, Rise, and Bellator, World Series of Fighting, Professional Fighters League, Invicta Fighting Championships, and even KSW, none has ever produced a night with that many fights, all resulting in a finish. Bang. Oh, it was uh, Saturday was a very, very violent night, and uh, I'm sure that makes all you bloodthirsty savages very happy. So, speaking of bloodthirsty savages, a wild man of MMA media, Patrick OJ, the, the sure dog resident business expert. Pat, what's going on with you, bro? Not much, man. Just hanging out, chilling. I'd like to say that my Twitter is all day OJ, because uh, last time I was on the show, you gave everyone else a chance to say their Twitter <laughs> and out, so because you hate me, but that's fine. So it's out there now. So everyone that follows Ant, unfollow him and follow me instead. That's that's my. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I definitely deserve that because that was a, a, a little bit of an error on my part by not allowing you to uh, address the good folks out there in the world. So let's go ahead and get started because we do have a nice amount of topics to cover this week. So we're going to start with uh, the what was the subject of the Saturday of the day, Bellator 225, 14 fights, 14 finishes, lots of violence along the way. So I'm going to start with with Jose. Where would you rank Bellator 225 among the greatest or most entertaining events of all time? All time, uh, maybe top five, but not not top three. So probably in that four or five range. Uh, UFC 199, off the top of my head, is the first one that comes to my mind. I was there for that one. That was uh, when Bisping knocked out Rockhold in the main event because you also had Clay Guida. Uh, I mean, Brian Ortega getting knocked out by Clay Guida. Dan Henderson knocking out Hector Lombard. You had Cruz Favor. I mean, Eden Andrade knocked out Jessica Penne. And the very first fight of the night was that, uh, what, what was it, the the uh, Polo Reyes versus uh, Dong Young Ma fight, which was like right. one of the fight, fight uh, of the years. Uh, yeah, Hol Holloway Lamas was on that as well. Hol Holloway Lamas. So, like, I, that one comes to mind. I think uh, Benil Darius actually knocked out James Vick on that card, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, in terms of, like, UFC, Bellator 225 was very violent, but if you look at UFC 199, which... Might not be the most violent, but it's the one that comes to my mind right now. That had the most high-level elite martial artists compared to Bellator 225. So I would have to lean, say UFC 199 would be the most violent in recent memory. So open forum, fellas, um, because I'm, I'm kind of of the mind where this doesn't rank as one of the most entertaining cards of all time to me, simply because the stakes weren't there. It was, it was great. It, it had a lot of action on it, but... Am, am I am I speaking crazy here, Pat? Ben, back me up. Am, am, am I talking wild here? No, I, I'm with you. I, I will say that, I mean, it was an incredibly entertaining card in the moment. I mean, from my personal experience, I didn't have any specific site duties re regarding the card. So I was trying to get some other stuff done with it going in the background. This was not a card to watch in the background because every 15 minutes I was looking up at my screen and seeing some wild shit. So I didn't get a whole lot done on Saturday. <laughs> uh, it was, I it was... It was like fireworks on the 4th of July. Like, just after every little low, there was another bang. So it was extremely entertaining. As an all-timer, I mean, 10 years from now, well, let me put it this way. Yeah, I mean, 10 years from now, will I go back and watch this card as an all-time great? Probably not. Again, because of the level of the stakes. Unless some of the people on that undercard turn out 
uh, to pan out into incredibly high level fighters. But, you know, I'll go back and watch, you know, Pride Bushido seven or nine, 10 years on or UFC 45, 15 years on or UFC 199. Just, you know, what has it been like four years? Uh, years. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because of the stakes, because of how important the fights were at the time and what those fighters brought into the cage with them and what they went on to do afterwards. I don't think this is one of those. I have the feeling it's going to be the answer to a trivia question for a long time. Uh, and there are individual fights that I'll certainly revisit, but it, it's not an all-timer. Hell of a lot of fun, though. Yeah, that, it, it, it was a good time watching it, for sure. But when I think of um, some of the all-time entertaining cards, I mean, even I don't, I don't put this one as the most entertaining card this year. I think UFC 239 is is going to be the the top one for me at the moment so of course that can change because we've got like 17 ufc events next week so <laughs> it, it's it, it's something it, it's something that can definitely change but i don't see bellator 225 as that as that top level uh event simply because the the stakes just weren't there for me like it's hard for me to compare you know a moment with um jorge Masvidal scoring an all-time great knockout uh, and, and and that being the the elite elite of welterweight, and then you have you know Matt Mitchell and Sergey Karatanov as a, as a main event. It just you know the two just don't compare to me. And, and what do you say, Pat? Oh well, I was I was gonna say I agree with all that f- for sure. And I think another thing that that puts this out of the range of an all time great is you didn't have any amazing wars or or very competitive fights that lasted very long. You you had a couple of third round finishes that were all right, but and you had the um Karatonoff one in in round 2, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't DC DC Stipe where that was a, you know, crazy back and forth fight where they're throwing nonstop or Romero Costa or at Alvarez Gagey or any of those all-time wars that's like wow, like the whole fight is entertaining. You had a lot of quick first round submissions or knockouts and then you had a couple of fights that went longer that yeah, to finish, but it wasn't, you know, oh, I have to watch this on the edge of my seat the whole time. Yeah, a good good observation there. It it had a feel of um of like a, a really entertaining regional card where there is clearly some very talented people that are just smoking everybody else. Uh so all right, uh let's let's move on a little bit from there while sticking to the topic of Bellator. So they announced that Frank Mayer versus Roy Nelson, uh, that rematch will be he- a headliner later on this year, I think in October. So, I mean, we've had this argument before, but this is, is this another case of the promotion relying too much on the aging names? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, at the same time, this is what they've hitched their wagon to. It's been the narrative forever. That, well, I, I, I said on this show last week, Bellator is like three different promotions stapled together. They are a, uh, a senior circuit for former UFC stars. They are an extremely intelligent farm league for people who are coming in at a high level from component skills of mixed martial arts, whether they be point karate fighters or high level wrestlers or jujitsu practitioners. And they're the most dismal regional promotion you've ever seen that stacks the card with 0 and 0 and 1 and 0 and 1 and 1 fighters who can sell tickets to their friends, family, and teammates. They are all those three things in one. And this is just the latest example of one of those three faces of Bellator. Uh, you know, th- I haven't looked at the undercard of this fight, but I'm sure there are probably two or three more interesting and more deserving fights of being the headliner. But just anyone with any iota of UFC name recognition definitely cuts to the front of the line in Bellator. And I mean, it's kind of a bummer because as much as I'm glad that Mira and Nelson are still cashing those checks, the fight's going to suck because their second fight sucked. (laughs) Their second fight was five years ago. Neither of them has gotten better since then. Uh, Yeah. I mean, that's all I have. They're relying too much. Yeah, I mean, Frank Mayer retired for a reason. I mean, last time we saw him, it, it wasn't too pretty. Um, Roy Nelson is is kind of hanging on by the the shred of his career. So, uh, Jose, man, is this um? Are you have you marked this on your calendar? You are are you anxious to tune into this one? Only because it's one of those Bellator cards where it's two cards in two days. So this will be the Friday, or I think it's the Friday card, similar to when um, Mitrione fought on a Friday, and then I think there was another Bellator card the Saturday after in the same arena. Uh, so for stuff like that, I don't, I get it, 
but like Frank Mir and Ryan Nelson, like I don't think that fight's going to go around. Someone's going to bed, whether it's probably going to be Frank Mir. Um, but for stuff like that, I, I don't like it headlining their major cards where there are, um, what would you, how would you call it? I don't, I don't like them headlining over, like, like if Michael Chandler was fighting, I would not want Mir and Nelson headlining that. Or if MVP was the co-main event, I would not want that. But for those Friday night fights going into a Saturday, I think, uh, Bellator Hawaii did something similar where Michael Chandler headlines, I think the Friday card and then the. The Saturday card was the Alima homecoming. I think that Friday one really got people excited for Bellator and they tuned in again. So maybe if they see heavyweight action and some see a former UFC t- champion facing an Ultimate Fighter winner and someone goes to bed, maybe they get excited for Saturday night. I hate it. I don't want to watch them fight. I think they should both be retired. But I don't. I get where I get where they're coming from. And if they're going to headline a card, I'm glad it's cards like that rather than like an actual marquee card. That's a good point. I mean, if, if they had, but even you look at uh, not just the other big names under the, the promotions banner, like an MVP or Michael Chandler, but say if they had, and of course I know he's booked on, on a different card, but say Adam Borix was, yeah. was somewhere lower on this card. You're just thinking like, is this really how you want to prioritize the level of talent that you have? Uh, so, so Pat, man, what's, um what's this like on the, on the Pat Richter scale? <laughs> I mean, this this ain't moving anything <laughs> at all. It's it's firmly at zero. Uh, but that being said, I mean, I'm I'm with Jose in that I I view when they do back to back cards like this, I view the first card kind of like as an extended undercard almost, where basically like, hey, we have a a day we we sleep and then we go back to Bellator. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I mean, I I don't particularly have a problem with it. They want. To draw seats in they're gonna get nostalgic people who are like oh i'll go buy a ticket to see that i mean they shouldn't be doing it i, I don't think either guy should be fighting but yeah i mean i i don't know it's fine i guess <laughs> for now yeah um I'm, I'm very curious as to what this is going to look like because we've seen quite a few train wrecks in in the senior circuit in, in bellator so i don't anticipate we'll see much different but it's just how much of a train wreck this one shall be so uh Keeping in line with the Bellator topic and uh, some sort of, um, I don't know, missteps by the promotion, does anyone think that they dropped the ball on their their huge free agent signing of uh, James Haskell, who's uh, apparently a big deal in the world of rugby? No, it's Bellator. <laughs> <laughs> No. Like, like if the UFC did it, yeah, but like not like it's Bellator. They signed Dada five thousand to fight Kimbo Slice. Like if someone was if if someone told me, hey, an MMA promotion signed a big hairy rugby player, what do you think it's gonna be? I'm like, oh, it's probably a Scott Coker run promotion. So no, I don't think they dropped the ball because I didn't have high expectations for it whatsoever. Like what was like when someone was seeing like this big hairy guy? I'm like, what is it gonna be Gabriel? Like best no. case scenario, Gabriel Gonzaga. Like I eh. think that. I think this is a, a case of upset expectations. Like he's only hairy if you were hoping those wrists were like cyborgs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I I think it was more so. It's, it's more so that they just tried to make this a big deal. Now maybe James Haskell is is the shit somewhere else. He, um, he is. Is that yeah? Uh, yeah. Okay. So so um, when when I I've, I've done some international traveling and I have some buddies over in England who who watch fighting regularly. And I asked them, cause I was like, James Haskell, I, I the name was familiar. Cause I had watched a little bit of rugby. So I, I knew that name, but I asked my buddies, I was like, so who like, is this a big deal? And like, dude, this is amazing. This is huge. This is like a, a, and more than one of them too, which was strange where they were like, this is a big deal for, for England. Like we love this dude. He carried us in, in rugby for so long. Like, it's not the equivalent of, like, Brock Lesnar going into MMA, but it might be the equivalent of, like, uh, CM Punk or, you know, someone like, uh, I forget the name, the football player, Herschel Walker. Yeah, Herschel yeah. Walker. Yeah, Her- Herschel Walker going in. Like, there, there is buzz over there. And, and he has, you know, a lot of followers and a lot of, of pull. And it makes sense given that Bellator is trying to expand into that European market. That's their whole thing right now is they're, they're like, let UFC take China, let, you know, one and them duke it out in Asia and all of that. Like, we're going to go over to the European market. We're doing the European fight series, all that other stuff. Like this is just all furthering that notion. So 
I don't think it's like a huge thing. I think a lot of American fans are let down, but I do think it actually did have some pop overseas. All right. So I guess we're just a little bit entitled and snobbish here yeah. on, on, on this side so, of the Atlantic Ocean. Minded, typical Americans. Jeez, go travel. Yeah, so, so go please, travel. all you international commenters, just destroy us for that one. I, I guess we deserve it. But I, I was I was so underwhelmed by that because I, I just don't watch rugby. And I don't think there's anyone here in the U.S. outside from the well-traveled Patrick OJ who, who watches rugby. So. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and so, so like, yeah, Jose. Now, I want to get back to something you said now. Now, you were you were disappointed. I mean, saying you weren't disappointed because it was Bellator. What was it? Was it the name or the way they did it or the combination or or, or what was it that that just kind of made you not even react? I didn't have a reaction when they teased it. They were teasing something, and I was like, it's probably like, like I couldn't think of anything worth like I couldn't. I personally couldn't think of anything. And that would get me excited. Like when they were teasing this thing, I was like, what could they like, are they going to sign Brock Lesnar? Like he's not like, they're not going to sign Brock Lesnar. They're not going to do like, I couldn't, I honest to God, couldn't think of what it could be. So my first reaction was like, well, why would I get my hope hopes up for something that's not going to be relevant in the end anyway? So like, I didn't have a reaction when it first happened, when they announced it, I was like, all right, like that, this is why I didn't have my hopes up. This is why I didn't have a reaction. So, uh, wasn't, wasn't disappointed because I, I don't. I just. I also didn't really care when they announced it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I can. I can understand that. I kind of thought they were pulling a rope of dope on us. I thought. I thought they were going to just have some you know, random tough guy model take these pictures, and then they were going to announce Cyborg. It's kind of, kind of the the direction I thought they were going in. So, so to hear James Haskell just kind of like who, uh, yeah, w- wasn't quite sure what was going on. But maybe I'll, I'll dust off some old rugby tapes. And, and, and see what we can dig up. All right, fellas. So now we're going to move on to shock and awe. And I want you guys to tell me about something to surprise you about the fights over the weekend, uh, whether it be Bellator or Titan FC uh, 56, whatever events you watched. And it could be pre-fight coverage, the fights themselves, or anything that happened after it. Ben, I'll start with you. Uh, there was a lot that, I mean, obviously, if nothing else, Bellator 225 delivered a lot of shock and awe. You know, that it was an electrifying uh, night of fights. Most of my shock and awe was just <clears throat> coming to grips with the fact that I've been wrong about a lot of fighters. Uh, Austin Vanderford th- appears more and more to be the real deal. Like, you know, the obvious jokes aside, he he looks like a, a for real fighter who, who might be a, a factor. Uh, Nick Newell. What do you do with Nick Newell? He's a for real fighter. The guy he beat on Saturday is not a dummy. And he got dummied. And, I mean, we didn't ask this, but that was my favorite finish of the 14 finishes on the night, was the one and a half arm arm triangle. That was a terrifying submission. Um, so, I mean, that, that's my, my, my shock and awe, was just, like, learning that, that you know, some fighters... Are, are more than just curiosities over there in Bellator, and particularly Newell. Uh, I wish he'd gotten a, a real sniff at the UFC. I was bummed by his uh, his appearance on the Contender Series because he lost, and he lost fair and square. He lost all three of those rounds for real. But I'm interested to see what he does because I, I think there are people in the UFC he could beat. There are definitely people in Bellator in that 170-pound division that he can beat. I'm kind of interested to see what his ceiling is. All right. All right, Pat, what about you? Um, I would say that uh, when Lara did her weigh-in and had all of the Amazon stuff written on on her, um, talking about that, that that actually gained a, a fair amount of viral traction and probably was the most press I saw for the entire Bellator 225 card, to be honest, um, which was which was surprising. Like, I thought, like, okay, I get what she's doing, but I didn't think it was going to be picked up Yo. by anybody, but it... it went places i saw it on a lot of sites i didn't expect i'm sorry those same words painted on timothy johnson's body would not have gone viral she has she has a good canvas for like bringing attention to the uh you know to to the causes of of her choice certainly would have looked a lot different i'm I'm sure uh but but you know shout out to her for for bringing uh some awareness to a, a very serious world issue uh while we're over here fighting over chicken sandwiches real things are going on so 
Uh, so, yeah, Laura, Laura definitely deserves some credit for that. All right, Jose, what's your shock and awe moment of Same uh, the thing. past weekend? I, the, Same the amount of negative comments that on our Instagram post when MMA Fighting posted a picture that of her with all of her words on, the amount of uh, vile, like, disgust in our comment section was appalling to me. Like, whether you agree with it or not, people were looking more at her... Like, they thought she was using it to get attention rather than, like, bring attention. Like, this will get me known. This will get me on sports. So I'm like, you don't know this. Like, you don't know Laura. She's like, she actually cares about this. Like, she if she would do this on a regional show. It would, she just happens to be on Bellator and she used it for the right reason. And the amount of comments I saw from fighters and fans who were saying this is a real good way to get noticed because then people will care about your next fight was very appalling to me uh, because she's like we all said like yeah she's has a great canvas for it but she cares about this thing this this situation quite a bit so the amount of awful comments that I heard based on what she was trying to bring attention to was very not shocking because it's MMA and every, like. If, if if anyone brings attention to anyone, they get upset. But the amount of negative comments that I saw on her post was was appalling to me, for sure. Yeah. So I was shocked at that. So, well, my, my shock and awe moment is your shock at MMA fans saying stupid things. Uh, that is a staple of our sport, and I'm sure we will talk about that a little bit more later. But my actual shock and awe moment comes from Bellator 225 also. And it was more so from the commentary team, or maybe not the commentary team, the, the analyst desk of uh, Chael Sonnen, uh, Josh Thompson, and what's, what's your man's name the guy that has the gym out here in L.A.? Jay Glazer? Yeah, Jay Glazer, right. So um, when they were commenting about uh, Sabah Hamasi calling out Austin Vanderford in his post-fight speech, and they actually thought that Vanderford was going to give this some attention when he was the next fight out. Like, like they probably had to pass each other you know, going to the cage, and they really thought that Vanderford was going to d distract from his fight that was coming up in seconds to address, you know, uh, a a cheap shot uh, attempt at a call out on, on the post fight speech. So that that was my moment right there. I, I think they probably should have known that that really wouldn't have made any waves, at least at the time that that it was attempted. So, all right, buy or sell, gentlemen. Now we had a. Uh, interesting interview with uh, Conor McGregor. Uh, he had a one-on-one -on -one with Ariel Hawani on ESPN last Friday, I believe it was. Got a whole lot of people talking, but first things first, are we, are we buying or selling Conor McGregor's sincere apology? Jose, I'll start with you. I think he's, uh, he's sincere that he got caught and it blew up in his face. Do you think he'd be apologizing if this wasn't on camera? That, but that's not Conor McGregor. That's just planet Earth. Um, I don't, I, I'm in, I, I see, I get, I'm, I appreciate that he apologized, but I also don't like, there's other things he should be apologizing besides getting caught hitting an old man that clearly wasn't even like, it didn't like, I don't know if you read the interview. I can't remember like some Irish media outlet out there. He gave an interview too. He goes, yeah, I was, my jaw hurt, but I, I can take a punch. So like of everything Conor McGregor has done. For him to apologize for this seems like like there's more things you should be apologizing about besides this. I just think he's apologizing because he got caught. Because again, this happened in April, and he's just apologizing for it now. Like, so indifferent because it's it's just weird. I don't know. Neither. <laughs> right, um, Ben. What, what's your take? Uh, <clears throat> I'm on the same page as Jose here. I I mean I do buy it cautiously. He's not a complete psychopath. He's not a, a serial killer. There has to be some level of consciousness or some... I mean, there, there's a difference between somebody with poor impulse control, you know, possibly worsened with external factors that they subject themselves to. <laughs> and somebody that does not feel anything when they sucker punch an old man. And there have there are whispers of much worse behavior around Conor McGregor within the last year or two. What I was looking at when I when I watched and yes I watched the video. I don't know why I watched the video, but <clears throat> my only question because he hasn't punched me, he hasn't busted my phone, he has not allegedly sexually assaulted me, he's not thrown dock loading equipment 
in my direction. He hasn't done any of these, these things to me, so I don't need to forgive him. All I'm looking for is, is there any inkling that he is resolved to do any differently going forward? And on some level, I think there is that. What I saw, and this is complete armchair psychology from an unqualified person, even if I were a psychiatrist, I'm not his psychiatrist. On some level, there has to be some sort of drive to get his life back on track. He loves to fight. He clearly misses it. If you look at him on social media, it is just this pathetic, desperate, constant attempt to stay in the headlines and he sees people passing him by and he sees the big fights happening without him and on some level he wants to be part of it i think seeing nate diaz return to the cage triumphantly was probably the worst thing or the best thing that happened to conor mcgregor since uh the mayweather fight i think if anything seeing nate diaz just casually get up you know dust the shake off of his shirt and uh, go out and win a high-level fight and set himself up for a possible title eliminator while McGregor is just out there doing whatever is probably killing him right now. So I believe it in that I think he is probably resolved to actually get back into the cage at this point. That's as far as it goes for me. Uh, uh, Pat, um, you think this is more about timing than anything else? Yeah. Yeah. I would I would say it is. Uh, I mean, like everyone said, the incident happened back in April, and he's just now apologizing for it now. And it really, I mean, if you look at it, a lot of people was like, oh, his apology with you know that like Ariel Hawani and all that. A lot of people are framing that, but like it was really just an interview, and like that came up, yes, and it, of course it's going to be addressed. But then the majority of the interview is him talking about how his foot was broken when he went to the Khabib fight, how he was training for MSG. Like the majority of that interview is like, I want to get back in the cage and I'm still the best. And I know you haven't seen me in forever, but Oh yeah, I hit that old guy. I'm sorry. That was dumb. I'm, I should get my life together, but you know, don't forget that I'm still the best around and here's, you know, all these awesome plans. And so I, I think, I think there is some truth to it where like his life has probably spiraled to a point where, you know, he's not, you know, in that, that hunt for the title and climbing up the ranks and, you know, becoming that big star. Now he's there and it's probably not as exciting as he thought it was going to be. And he wants to fight again. And, you know, there's tons of other factors I'm sure, but I think it's almost certainly timing. I think if he was not going to fight again or didn't want to fight again and there wasn't video or there wasn't videotape of it, he wouldn't even <laughs> be talking about it. He would never address it. Yeah, I'm, I think it's just a combination of all these different factors because the video comes out and then right after that, Nate Diaz fights uh, Jorge Masvidal. And then on top of that, Nate Diaz doesn't mention Conor McGregor's name at all. Um, now, now, Jose, um, you know, we were there for fight week for 241 and I made a conscious effort to not be that guy. I, if I'm remembering correctly, you weren't that guy either. But um, I did not want to talk about Conor McGregor to Nate Diaz. Um, and and then every time his name was brought up, Diaz would just dismiss it and move on to the to the next subject. Um, I, I really think that McGregor sat there, saw that, and then this video comes out, and then it's like, okay, he's getting pushed further and further and further out of this conversation, and and now it's time to do something. So what do you do? You you get the the most popular uh, media personality in mixed martial arts to have a sit down with you, and. There it is. PR campaign starts up. Yeah, you're telling me that Conor McGregor is using another fighter's success to benefit his own? Shocking. Never would have <laughs> thought that was possible. But yeah, it's like it's it's why no matter who is fighting, Conor McGregor has to tweet. Like I remember I was at UFC 240 and in Edmonton and Gavin Tucker won. First fight in like two years since getting his whole face destroyed. And the last time they went to Edmonton. And Conor McGregor tweeted about Mark Goddard, the referee, in the fight. At, even though, and then the, one of the questions was, "Hey, did you see Conor McGregor tweet about your fight to Gavin Tucker?" And Gavin Tucker's like, "So, like, who cares? Like, this dude's just trying to make a name off of what's in the zeitgeist right now." So, no, uh, it's. I wasn't surprised that he did that. I'm not surprised Nate did that because I don't know if you also watched the interview with Brett Okamoto that the trilogy with yeah. Conor was never the reason that he didn't come back to fight. It's because he wanted to get paid, and he felt like they were promoting guys that. Uh, he was better than it. He never was like, give me the third Connor fight, I'll never return. He just wanted to get money and get respect. 
Uh, and he felt slighted that Connor got the immediate rematch after their first fight, and he didn't get the trilogy fight after their second fight. So it had nothing to do with Connor at all. Like he was genuinely happy that Conor McGregor gets paid and gets all this money. So I think it, I don't think Connor knows how to respond to someone that's like saying, "Hey, Connor, good for you. I'm glad you're getting all this money. You don't have to fight this and that." And Connor, I was probably expecting Nate to come in guns blazing, and when he didn't, he didn't know how to react. So he's like, well, I'll do what Nate's doing. So it's it's just Connor. Like he's just it, it's. I said it the same when he apologized. Like, duh, he's gonna be doing this because he. It's it's the thing that we've seen Connor do for the last two years. So no, I want like it's it's no surprise to me whatsoever. All right. So uh, of course, as as Pat alluded to. Uh, most of this interview consisted of McGregor talking about his future plans uh, getting in the cage. So let's let's dive into that uh, for a moment before we kind of open up the door for for more of a meta conversation there. But he listed a, a few different names that that piqued his interest. Of course, the Nate Diaz trilogy. Of course, the uh, the rematch with uh, Habib Nurmagomedov, uh, a rematch with Dustin Poirier and Jorge Masvidal, uh, to name uh, just a few of the guys that that he brought up. I think Frankie Edgar was another one that he mentioned, but. Out of out of those names that he mentioned, uh, what's what's your pick for what, what would you like to see next out, out of anybody? I'll jump in. I think uh, McGregor's kind of in a tough place, and as everybody seems to sort of sense here, he probably realizes that as well, which is why he chose this moment to step up. But of the names you mentioned, obviously Nurmagomedov and Poirier are spoken for. They're uh, fighting soon. It, I would not put it past the UFC to slot Mer, uh, McGregor straight into a title shot at the winner, but that would suck. That would be, I mean, it would be a horrible decision competitively, even if I would not put it past him to do it. Of the other names you mentioned, Diaz and Masvidal have already kind of tacitly agreed on this, and I don't see any reason the UFC wouldn't make it happen, and I don't want McGregor to ruin that. So if he wants to come back in, I, he could wait for the winner of Diaz and Masvidal, or he could take any top 15 lightweight who doesn't have a fight booked. I mean, Ally Quinta was kind of floating it out there because, I mean, calling out Conor McGregor for the last 18 months, if you're between 145 and 170 pounds, it's the equivalent of a Super Bowl quarterback saying, I'm going to Disneyland. You know, what do you want next? Uh... Anyone the UFC wants to put in front of me, but uh, Conor McGregor, where are you at? Is kind of what you say when you win a fight in those divisions and you're in the top 10. Uh, so for me, McGregor kind of has to kind of has to wait and see. Not go to the back of the line because he's still a legit top 10 talent, but kind of has to wait and see. Yeah, you know, at, at this point, I'm, I'm kind of feeling him just taking a fight that can get him a win. Um, I mean, that was that was the the appeal of the Cowboy fight. That that stylistically, it it made a lot of sense. Competitively, it made a lot of sense, and it just didn't happen because of stupid reasons. But that a, a fight like that makes sense. Now, Cowboy's book with Justin Gaethje. No, he was really entertaining that Justin Gaethje fight uh, until until he broke his hand. Um, I like that. I think that's a dangerous one as far as him getting back in the win column. Maybe maybe Anthony Pettis makes sense now. And now since he's coming off of a loss too. I, I can see that. Any any uh, thoughts on that, fellas? Yeah, he needs to fight the winner of Justin Gaethje and Donald Cerrone. Like, I don't care where or when, but he has to fight the winner. Justin Gaethje is a guy that will get people excited no matter who he fights. Doesn't need to talk. Connor needs – Connor clearly needs a fight that won't get him in trouble outside of the fight. Like, the thing with between him and Habib is there was all of that nonsense, that awful, like – like people they're bringing religion and wives and personal stuff like he needs a fight that's just an, a high level martial arts fight justin gaethje is one of the top five most exciting mma fighters in the history of martial arts like, i'll go to i'll die on that hill like justin gaethje versus a door i would watch <laughs> if, if he beats cowboy cerrone he's not getting a towel anytime soon because the winner of dozen poirier and habib should fight tony ferguson that's a, that's that's reality. What's the next best thing about besides fighting for title? Conor McGregor. Justin Gaethje beats Donald Cerrone. Give him Conor McGregor. Donald Cerrone somehow beats Justin Gaethje, which I'm not picking. Donald Cerrone does historically cannot beat Southpaws. He cannot beat Southpaws. He has the most wins in the history of the UFC, most head kick knockouts, most like stoppages, like most bonuses. You name it. Donald Cerrone either has the record or is number two. 
he will. I would pick. I would heavily favor Conor McGregor against Donald Cerrone, mostly because Donald Cerrone is one of those fighters that loses fights before he he even enters the octagon. He's an historically a very slow fighter. Conor McGregor is probably the fastest fighter in the division when they start when when he's there. Like you saw, he knocked out Aldo in 13 seconds, and then he gasses against Nate Diaz. Don, Conor McGregor beats the guy who has all of the records. That he's back. He's there. He's he. Donald Cerrone is also one of those few. Him and Nate, I, maybe Tony at this point, and Masvidal too, are some of the only fighters where they have fan bases that will boo Conor. Like, remember when Habib came out when he stared out against Dustin Poirier in Las Vegas? Las Vegas booed Habib because he beat Conor. Donald Cerrone is one of those guys that could make it fan base versus fan base. So, winner of Gaethje versus Donald Cerrone is literally the only fight I'm interested in. Anthony Pettis is cool, but I think Anthony Pettis should fight the, the winner of uh, Iaquinta and Hooker. Because they that that's just that actually like makes sense title wise, but I, I think winner of Cowboy Gaethje is the only fight I want to see Connor take. You know what? You've you've convinced me. Um, oh, Pettis, no. Pettis against a uh, Quinto or Hooker just sounds. Oh, that sounds beautiful, Pat. Uh, who, who's your top pick? So my my pick was going to be exactly what Jose said. Between uh, yeah, I mean I, I have no idea why you would not book the winner of Gagey versus Cowboy against McGregor. That's a perfect fight. That also should be, either way, whoever McGregor gets, it should be a tune-up fight for him. I think he should easily beat both. Um, as you know, Gagey would be a more interesting fight and definitely be super violent, but uh, I, I think McGregor should be able to handle either one of them and then, again, right back in the picture. If for some reason those guys aren't available, the only other fight that I can think of that I would care to see it all, and I wouldn't even care that much, but if I had to pick something that wasn't the winner of those two, it would be RDA. Just, you know, RDA's coming off a loss, and he's still, you know, he's still a monster. That fight was supposed to happen and never did because RDA broke his foot, and then you got Diaz and the whole thing happened. I think that could work too, but I would much rather prefer uh, Gagey or Cerrone. Yeah, I, li I like those ideas. All right, so let's let's move on to uh, continuing with the theme of the Conor McGregor interview. Uh, Luke Thomas uh, put out a video in response to this, which raised some interesting questions for us as as media members. Um, now, he uh, was was very adamant about MMA interviews kind of being bullshit, just kind of being uh, more PR, more so um, just a work of fiction, if if you want to put it in those words. But so. Uh, what do you think we can do as media members to improve upon this? Uh, and, and in fact, do you even agree with those statements uh, to, to begin with? Open forum, gentlemen. I'll start because I used to work with Luke. Um, uh, <laughs> I, it's, if someone's going to say that, it's going to be Luke. Uh, he's one of those guys that's very protective of, of media, not just MMA media. I get where he's coming from. I absolutely do. I've had these conversations with him. I think a lot of... Uh, up-and-coming journalists, these young bloggers, these young, I'm sure all of us have been in those situations when you're on the rise and you get your first interview and you basically use it as a PR stunt for the fighter rather than digging in deep with questions. We've all, we've all been there. Um, I, I don't agree with him 100% that interviews are like BS because sometimes you set up an interview and the fighter wants to talk about, they want to talk about difficult situations. Like I know my friend Jim, Ed, our friend Jim Edwards, he interviewed Darren Till and Darren Till before the interview was like, I'm, I want to talk about these things because people need to know. Like I'm sure Connor did the same thing with Ariel. The thing with Ariel might've been a little different. I get where Luke's coming from with that. Him and Ariel uh, used to work together. Maybe that, maybe there was personal thing in there. I don't know. I don't want to speak for Luke at all i haven't spoken with luke in a little bit but if anyone was going to bring it up it's going to be luke he's very protective of uh of our jobs our landscapes and he wants everyone to do well but it's a very difficult question i don't think they're fiction fictional whatsoever i do think there are 100 percent mma media that cater to the fans and just ask the salacious questions that fans want to hear uh it's a i know we've all seen it and i know we've all, all probably all like cringed or or been like, what is this this guy doing in here? What drives me crazy is when we're at mm -hmm. press conferences and people take the mic and they're like, what's up, man? Like, we're here with the greatest fighter of all time, John Jones. And I'm just like, dude, go on. Yeah. <laughs> so what can we do as MMA media to improve those, the, like, improve this? I just think you got to be professional. That's I tell everyone that. You're there to do a job. You're not there to make friends and take photos. If, they, if something happened, ask about it. If Paulo Costa gets flagged by USADA, ask about it. 
Don't say, hey, what do you think of Yola Merrill? Because like, he's been asked for that. Ask the tough questions, even if it means you're going to lose your interview. Because at the end of the day, no, no comment is still an answer. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, you know, as someone who has personally ri- risen a, a risen the ire of a, of a few fighters and promoters and whatnot, um, I, it def- yeah, I mean, it, it definitely, man, is um, I, I think approaching it with a level of sincerity is yeah. is, is really the key. Like it, there there are plenty of times where we have to suppress the fanboy in us because at the end of the day, we were fans to begin with. Otherwise, we would not be covering a sport that um, is so kind uh, yeah. to, <laughs> to to the people that work so hard to keep it going. Man, um, like you, you got to suppress that. You you have to approach things with a level of honesty and sincerity. And what are the what are the questions that you genuinely want answered? You personally, as, like when I when I step in front of a fighter to interview them, um, I want to know whatever I'm asking you about. I'm genuinely con- concerned. Like, I'm genuinely curious. What is your answer to this question? And I think if you approach it in that sense, you can you can find something meaningful. But I will say this, though, for sure, and, and I think we've all been through this as we've been through our fair share of media days. When a fighter's cutting weight, and they're being yeah. asked a million times over and over again about the weight cut, about how you think the fight goes. And and yeah, there, there are questions that, that they're going to get asked a million times and somebody's got to ask them, but you kind of know those are bullshit. I, I, think, I think we all can accept that. Um, and, and, and that part of it will never change. And I think that's something that's more of, um, more of a problem with sports media in general and not just the fight game. I think the fight game might enhance it because the level of, of confidence and kind of, um, I don't know, mental distance from, from reality is necessary for, in order for them to perform better. So facing some of these questions may not be in their best interest, but I don't know, fellas, am I, am, am I talking crazy here, Ben? Um, is, is that you take a similar approach to media days and whatnot? Well, I think there's something slightly unique about uh, sports media in general and certainly MMA media more so even than most uh, sports in that we did start as fans. And I mean, most, if not all of us are, you know, kind of intrigued by the idea of access. Like, I don't think anybody becomes like a beat writer for politics in, you know, Washington or New York because they're interested in meeting politicians or if they are, they're a sick person. But somebody (laughs) that like, you know, becomes a beat writer for the local, you know, stick and ball team or starts, you know, blogging about local MMA, it's because they love the sport and they think the personalities are interesting and they kind of want to be in and part of that circle. And if you have a sense of self-preservation about keeping that level of access, it can taint you in a way that no money has to cross the table. Like if you know, Hey, if I ask this fighter, this question, I'm not getting invited back, or I may even be explicitly blackballed. uh, I mean, there's a moral choice there and I'm as guilty as the next person. I mean, I covered UFC on ESPN four in San Antonio with, uh, I was there with some sure dog guy. I don't even remember who it was. Oh, it, it was it was Pat right My there. <laughs> but I, I'll tell you guys something, <laughs> something very straight and something very personal. By the end of that weekend, and we achieved a division of duties where I was kind of on production detail, where I was uploading and tagging and watermarking video, and he was actually doing the scrums. You know, but by the end of that. I mean, there were questions that I was upset at myself for not having asked Greg Hardy. But by the time I reached that realization, it would have been really, really strange for the guy who had been quiet for three days to suddenly, like, push his laptop aside and, like, swagger on up to the, you know, to the forest of mics. You know, but that's going to haunt me for a long time. Especially as someone from an outlet that will probably never be granted an... (laughs) uh, and uh, an exclusive with Greg Hardy if they know what's good for them. Uh, <clears throat> you know, so I, I mean, I felt it, you know, and I'm a member of the, the MMAJA, you know, for, you know, for, for all it does right now. It, it's, th- there's a constant tension there, you know, between the people that are interested or, or if not interested, people that are part of the access journalism world 
where they speak to the personalities at the highest levels of the sport and the others that report as observers and are more free to ask whatever they want, whatever they think the audience wants asked. Uh, so I don't know if interviews are sheer fiction, but they're definitely an agreed upon presentation of the truth. You know, when you watch a movie, even if you watch a documentary that's purports to be the unvarnished truth, you are seeing what's within the scope of that camera and you're not seeing what's two inches, you know, outside of the shot. And at the very least, when we are uh, doing interviews, certainly live interviews, like public interviews, you know, we, we control where that camera points and what's in and out of the shot. So we're, we're at least manicuring the truth, you know, into a kind of agreed upon mix of truth and fiction. Sorry uh -huh. if that was too much. Oh, no, no, no. Beautiful. Uh, Pat, any anything you want to add to this? No, I mean... I think those two pretty much covered it all. Uh, I, I don't think, you know, I, I don't think that it's fiction. I don't think that it is, um, you know, I, I think a big part of it is that you, you just like you guys have said, you, you know, if you're trying to make your way up and you're trying to do things, uh, you, you have certain questions and certain things you stay away from because otherwise the promotion might, might lash out at you. I remember at UFC 238, uh, it was my first UFC event. I was was in line. We had the media day scrum, and for or, well, first we were doing all uh, all exclusives, and then by the end of it, it kind of devolved into a scrum. And at one point, I was with scrum with a couple other people, and I was I finally got to talk to Cowboy, and I had just generally had some questions that I genuinely wanted to ask him about uh, union stuff, and I started asking him. About how he felt about unions because he had you know his whole involvement in uh bjorn remby's short-lived uh you know whatever that was with kane and tj and all that stuff but you know because basically it traced back to he said there's no more money fights i was like do you think a union's the way to go and cowboy was real cool and candid with it all but the other people there that were like in part of the scrum one had moved away completely and the other was like kind of looking at me cringy and like kind of like looking over and I was like, well, I generally wanted to ask about this. And like nobody explicitly said anything afterwards, but I got the vibe of like, oh, I wasn't supposed to talk about that. I wasn't supposed to ask that. That's weird. Um, and it's one of those things where like, again, you, you know, it's the with the way things are right now and the power that promotions have. It's if you want a career, you kind of have to know either I'm going to ask the tough questions and possibly never go to a live event again or get an interview or I'm going to, you know, ask quite tough questions as I think I can without crossing that line. And that that sucks, and I would love for it to change one day, and I hope it does. But right now, that's, that's the reality I feel like most journalists face. I also feel like a fair amount of it is there are a lot of people there, as I know all of you guys know, that are kind of doing journalism stuff, but they are not super original with their questions or what they want known, and they ask part of the reason that they ask the same 10 questions of every single fighter like how is your weight cut oh how do you think the fight's going to be like what do you think he's bringing to the table as just like a set they they have they do no research into anything whatsoever they just have their set questions and then just want it filmed and gone so i think that's part of it too i think it's a weird mishmash of all that but yeah it sucks i hope it i hope it gets better you know, I think another aspect, too, that, that we should keep in mind is that um, the the term media is is such a broad term that there are different uh, functions of media. There are investigative guys. There are guys who are more catered to fan um, uh, to fan interests. There are people who want to like like you, Patrick, you cover a lot of business stuff. So that's kind of your forte. And there there are different functions of media and media members. So. I think the the broad spectrum of just throwing this label on everyone who fills up a crowded uh, room for media day probably isn't the fairest assessment of the 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 minds that are in the building and what everyone has to offer on an individual basis. So now we're going to move on to what is my favorite part of the show, and that is the lightning round. So I'm going to get the timer ready. And you guys are going to have 30 seconds to answer the questions. And yes, I'm hoping someone goes over because I feel like cutting somebody off. <laughs> yes, I'm talking to you, Ben. <laughs> so, uh, so Ben, I'm going to have you start this off to show our, our good friend Jose how it's done. You've got 30 seconds to answer this question. 
How much do you think Matt Mitrion's new mouthpiece affected him in his fight and his subsequent knockout loss to Sergey Karatanov? You have 30 seconds, my man, and go. It affected him slightly. It sure didn't seem to affect him much when he was winning. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I picked Mitrion to win the fight. I was wrong, but the, the mouthpiece was not the deciding factor. You know, the if Karatanov was going to win, that's how he was going to win mouthpiece or not. You know, it, 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 it may have made a difference, but not a big one. All right. So, unfortunately, you went under time, so I didn't get the chance to cut you off. Um, but I should just go ahead and ask Jose the same question, man. How much did you think the mouthpiece affected him? I think it affected him a lot more than he let on. I know he did the right thing and said that's not the reason I lost. But if you've ever – I've been in an amateur MMA fight, and anything that annoys you and gets in your head and gets you out of focusing on your game plan, regardless of what you say, it played some – factor and i don't know if it played a huge factor but i definitely think it played more into his loss than he let on because he he turned his back and got knocked out so like that clearly played some factor mitrion did the right thing but so more than he let on is my answer all right oh perfect 30 seconds oh, i was just same was... rodeo man come on now <laughs> man i was i was just about to cut you off man oh man you, you disappointed me there but good job jose all right pat Mouthpiece, was that the deciding factor for Matt Mitrion? Uh I I agree in that I with Jose in that I think it affected him more than he let on, especially the last time it went out and, and the ref saying, you know, you're gonna lose a point if it comes out again, and it comes out again, and you can see his arms kind of drop and he looks over like he's either gonna go pick it up or he's waiting for the ref to you know get in there and stop the fight so he can put it back in. And then he turns around and he's like, Oh, fight's still going on. I gotta, you know, keep fighting and then Karatanov just knocked him out. So, yeah, I don't think it's the main reason he lost, but I definitely feel like it played a significant enough role. I'm glad he downplayed it, though. I think he did the right thing there, but yeah. It- All right. All right. Good job, Pat, right there. Just made the buzzer. So, I'll go ahead and start the clock for myself. Yes, I think it had an effect. It w- it probably wasn't the absolute deciding factor, but it definitely had an effect. I can think of many times where I've sparred with the wrong mouthpiece, and it annoyed the hell out of me. My favorite mouth guard, I dropped on the ground like near some dog poop a few weeks back. Can't use it, of course, so I got to spare one that sucks, and it bothers me. Like I was sparring Saturday, and it really bothers me. It annoys the hell out of me. It would annoy the hell out of me in a professional fight against a monster like Karatanov. Oh, man, that was so under 30 seconds. I'm incredible. Now, uh, next question, and, and I'll, I'll start with, with you on this one, Pat. Uh, Scott Coker believes that Ryan Bader can defeat Stipe Miocic, but out of the two, who would you favor in this matchup? I don't think you'll need 30 seconds, but I'm going to ask you anyway. 30 seconds. Miocic, that's, that's it. There's no other acceptable answer. It's Miocic. I, Ryan Bader is very good. Yes, he's, he's a top you know, top 10 light or heavyweight, probably sure. But I don't know. I don't even know about that. I mean, but well, yeah, yeah. I'd say he's top 10 anyway, but no, Miocic a hundred percent. That's no. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm not even going to bother starting the clock, Ben. Um, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, th- this is a case of things being distorted by Bader moving to a, a different promotion. He is a very good heavyweight. He's looked like he has a new lease on life. Uh, he is not, I would not favor him even remotely to beat uh, Miocic. Bader is an improved striker. Uh, Miocic is one of the better boxers in the sport. I think their wrestling is about a push. I would favor Miocic enormously over Bader. All right. And Jose. I'm going to have to take a pass on this one because I am a good journalist and Ryan Bader is a very close friend of mine from college. And he is one fighter that if he fights, I tell my boss, can't cover that unbiasedly. And I close my computer. Uh, So I will not write about Ryan Bader because I've known him even before I was an MMA media member. So uh, I will politely decline out of respect for my friend and you guys as fellow journalists. Oh, my goodness, Jose with the integrity. That's what's up. <laughs> oh, man, I wish I had a prize to give up, man. You you a special motherfucker. That's what's I, up. I, I, <laughs> yeah, so um, I'll just go ahead and, and, and speak my piece on this. This is, this is promoter hyperbole. Scott Coker should be doing this. He should be boosting up his man. He should be hyping him up. Ryan Bader is definitely a legit heavyweight. He's earned his heavyweight belt. Um, but when you're talking about Stipe Miocic, you're talking about perhaps the greatest heavyweight of all time. That's still active, still very much uh, looks like he's hasn't lost a step at all. 
Yeah, I, I think that settles that. I, I would heavily favor Stipe to win that fight. But our next two questions are about C.B. Dalloway and Aaron Simpson, right? <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> when I, actually, we should be talking about uh, C.B. Dalloway um, because of his his uh, his test failure today. So, or at least the announcement of his test failure. Um, but. We didn't prep a question ahead of time because these questions were prepped before this news <laughs> broke. And uh, perhaps I'll sneak it in toward the end. But we've got one last lightning round question for you, gentlemen. And I think this is one that we all will enjoy. Jose, you look so enthusiastic. So I'm going to start with you. Now, Andrew Luck, the quarterback for the Indianapolis Colts, he suddenly retired. Uh, I believe this was yesterday or, or was it Saturday that he that he announced his retirement? Um, we you say? Two days. Two days ago. Okay. So, yeah. So, Saturday he announces his retirement. Uh, is This um, burned down everyone's timelines, whether you were on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, anything. Uh, it, was, it was a dumpster fire. And now I want to know this. Who's worse, MMA fans or NFL fans? Uh, I would 100% say MMA fans because MMA fans, uh, they – NFL fans – boo andrew luck which is atrocious and i hated everything about it but they boo because they are that loyal to their their team at the end of the day they don't hate andrew as a human they wish he was on the team and they're mad he's leaving their team they boo fighters because they quote unquote aren't getting concussions they aren't trying to kill the other human they boo tyron woodley because he's not he puts together a good game plan that is a personal attack towards someone put to, p doing their job rather than saying, hey, I want you to stay on my team. I wish you were staying around. I'm bummed at your decision. I hate both. Angelo should not be booed. He played with a lacerated kidney, for crying out loud. But at the end of the day, MMA fans are booing fans because they wish they were getting concussions, and Andrew Luck was booed because they wanted him to stay and they felt slighted that he's leaving. So MMA fans are worse. You know what? You went way over the 30 seconds, but Good. you know what? I didn't have the heart to stop you because it was beautiful. I wanted you to stay up on that soapbox and preach to the congregation, my brother. Ben, it's your turn. I don't know if this mercy is going to carry over because I've been waiting to cut you off for a couple of weeks now. <laughs> but if you're out there preaching that good shit, I might let you stay on there. Tell me, 30 seconds, man. NFL fans or MMA fans, who is worse? MMA fans are worse, but ultimately fans are going to fan. I was more stunned at the reaction of the enormous peanut gallery of hot take NFL media. Yeah. I like that. That's what stunned me that like, if not respected, at least listened to and followed members of the NFL media. We're calling Andrew Luck like a wimp and a coward for doing what's right for his own health and the future of his family. And as much as, uh, you know, fans and their own promoter like gave George St. Pierre or Michael Bisping like shit for walking away from the sport when and how they did saying, well, he walked away because he was afraid of this guy or he knew he was going to lose just complete bullshit because no coward steps into the cage at that level. Uh, like, at, at least that doesn't really happen in the MMA media. The MMA media is generally overwhelmingly positive when a fighter makes a conscious decision to quit not on his back staring at the lights at the uh, in the ceiling. So I was disappointed in the mainstream media covering the NFL in, in the wake of this because, uh, you know, uh, Jose's right. Fans booed because they were frustrated and upset and mad in that moment and sad for their team, but they don't hate Andrew Luck, except for a few remote assholes here and there. Uh, MMA fans, much worse, but mercifully, MMA media, not. All right. And just as merciful as the entire MMA media as a whole, I am in allowing you to continue past 30 seconds. Thank Pat. You. Oh, of course, man. Pat, it is your turn to step up on the soapbox. Preach, my brother. I, I mean, MMA fans, 100 percent. They are they are far worse for <laughs> every, almost every single reason. Um, I mean, mind you, like there are people like I lived in Indianapolis for a while. I have some friends there. There are people that genuinely hate Andrew Luck because now, you know, you got Jacoby Br Brissett who's stepping in. So that team is not looking so great, um, especially after being as good as they were last year. But yeah, like, I mean, the dude made a call about his health. It's the right call. People are going to boo and, and be pissed. But yeah, it's it's out of frustration. It's because they don't have a crazy good backup if, if they were sitting on a first round draft pick right now 
uh, QB, they wouldn't care nearly as much. They'd be like, good, good for you, Andrew. It's all about the team and all about that. Uh, the only thing in which NFL fans are probably worse than MMA fans, which is hard to say because fights break out all the time in MMA, but I have seen people go to Raiders games, and Jesus Christ, some of those diehard Raiders <laughs> shit out of you. So, <laughs> like, just Dude. for being on the other team, like, it's, it's crazy. That's the only crazy part. That but, That yeah. is self-preservation. If I'm at an NFL game and I'm looking around, I see a bunch of size 56 camo shorts around me, I will throw it out with any of those assholes. MMA, you never know when, like, the tiny dude has some cauliflower ear under that beanie. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I'm wary at an MMA show where at an NFL game, I don't give a shit. Yeah, there, there's a certain level of fear, I think, that that's that goes around at an MMA show because chances are there, there's a, there's a good there's a good chance that the person sitting next to you is not untrained. Oh that yeah, you're gonna you're gonna be on a YouTube video called "Old Head Schools Young Thug." Yeah, you know, it, that, like, <laughs> like for real, like you you can very well be sitting next to, especially if you go to a regional show. You're probably sitting next to the guy who's fighting his sparring partners. You're sitting next to his family. You're you're going to be surrounded by people who are engulfed in the MMA world, which means they might know how to fight. So you might want to watch your P's and Q's. You might want to not talk that good shit. Now, if you go to a bigger event, there, you know, a UFC event will attract a lot of casuals who probably don't look like they've ever lifted up a pencil in their life. Um, it probably couldn't punch their way through a wet paper bag, but they will be there loud and drunk. Now, I will say this. MMA fans have to be the worst um, in, in comparison to NFL fans because at least I, I, I like Jose's take on this, that the, the loyalty of a team is, is somewhat of a redeeming quality. But, I mean, MMA fans, for wanting to see such bloody, you know, violent, damaging entertainment – really don't give a shit about the people who are being bloodied and being damaged. Uh, and I would say even more so than NFL fans. At least NFL fans can look back and, and see, like, guys who've been paralyzed on the field. And you hear about certain injuries, you're like, oh, man, you can't, you can't move around like that. So it's all right if this guy sits out or whatever. Um, and, and with all the, the uh, attention brought to concussions and brain health in, in the NFL, there's some level of awareness that MMA fans just seem to have forgotten about. Or just not have paid attention in the first place. So all of us have either coached, fought, competed, trained, or whatever, and been backstage for a fight or been in someone's corner or something like that. And, and I will tell you this, for all of you who have not had any close-up experience with it, it is a much different thing when you see someone you care about or yourself busted up. Uh, you don't recognize them the next day. Um, with packs of ice over their head and everything. It's a wild time. Uh, show some respect to those guys out there doing it. All right? And I definitely went way over my 30 seconds, but it's all good because I'm the host and I control the clock. I can't be stopped. I'm incredible. All right. Now we're going to move on from the lightning round. We're going to move on to the UFC's event in China this week. Jessica Andrade is going to put uh, her uh, title on the line against Weili Zhang. Now, out of the, the card, um, of course, the main event has some intrigue, being a title fight, uh, being that Weili Zhang is, is, is quite the prospect who's kind of risen fast in the, in the UFC. What other fights are, are sparking your, your attention here? Uh, ben, I'll start with you because I know you've done a deep dive on this card. Give me one good fight aside from the main event. I, I can't give you one good fight. I've got two. Uh, my guy, Derek Krantz, you know, anyone that's coming up from Texas, you know, gets extra love for me just because I probably saw him fight way back when. Krantz is a good dude. He took his UFC debut on ultra short notice. He had a disgustingly hard short notice weight cut that if we're talking about uh, journalistic integrity, I was sworn to silence on because I was talking to him like the day uh, of the fight. <laughs> but he's getting his real uh, chance now against Kanan Song. And that should be a banger. But, I mean, the real highlight of the card, the People's Main Event, the People's Republic of Main Event, since it's <laughs> taking place in China, <laughs> Eliseo Capoeira versus Zhang Long Li. I mean, I don't know if you guys are of the generation that played Beyblade, but seriously, those are two dudes. I don't think... It's on the short list of, in the history of the UFC, the two guys where they are just the most going, zoop! and dropping him in there. These two guys do not know how to walk backwards. Uh, they are offensive fighters, to say the least. 
uh, Eliseo in particular throws some exotic stuff. I don't see any way that's a boring fight. It should just be an absolute murder scene for the three to 12 minutes at last. All right. Like that one. Jose, what, what are you uh, looking forward to on this card? Andre Sukumtov, he's the only fighter on the UFC roster from Rhode Island, so I gotta give him some some love for representing him in the smallest state in the world. He chooses to live in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, which is truly baffling to me. I've asked him, like, why are you the only human <laughs> being who consciously chooses to live in that city? And he's like, I like it. I'm like, you're lying, but I'll believe you. I'll- <laughs> <laughs> I believe you believe that, but in your heart of hearts, you don't want to live in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. So, Andre Sugentop, shout out to the Asian sensation representing the 401 uh, fantastically. I know he gets a lot of hate for his fight against Sugar Sean O'Malley, who says, where they say he had the lowest fight IQ in the history of the UFC, but Andre Sugentop representing the 401, so got to give him some love. All right. So, um, journalistic integrity is passed aside for hometown bias. Shout out to Rhode Island. Pat. Tell me, what are you looking forward to on this as Jose throws up his gang signs? Uh, so aside from the fights that uh, Duffy mentioned, um, you know, honestly, for me, I am I am super interested to see the outcome of this card. And this is going to – this is the business side of me. Uh, you've got the UFC making this ridiculous push into China – putting so much money into it like the air asia deal that they made the uf photo shoots like the amount of money i've been digging into this the amount of money that they put into that stuff is insane the ufc performance institute there is three times the size of the vegas one it's going to be like the landmark place is what they're calling it for for all of asia to come to and so if th- this whole title fight is a hundred percent based on on Zhang getting a shot to win so that if they win, that's just, hey, all, all of your fans of China, come look at us because now you have a Chinese champion. That's huge. And even even Lee uh, Ji Lang getting the, um, getting the shot against Dos Santos is what? He's fighting a ranked guy after being, what, two and one against not two great fighters, to be honest. Like his two wins are not, I mean, again, big push. Like they are, this is a giant business move by the promotion i really want to see if it pays off or if it blows up in their face because if the Ouija gets knocked out and zang gets knocked out super quick you can best believe they're not going to be happy i don't know that they'll show it but they're they're probably dana's probably gonna be real pissed off <laughs> <laughs> well um one fight that i think is is flying under the radar here mark de la rosa versus kai car fronts i i'm i'm very uh very eager to see what that looks like um, and Kai Kaikara France repping Tiger Muay Thai, and they've they're just really exciting camp to to watch lately. So I'm I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what he has to offer. So um, another thing that I think should be very interesting about this card is what is MMA Twitter going to look like at 2 a.m. when this is going on? Um, I I'm I'm wondering. Part of me wants to stay up just to see how silent the timeline is going to be, but I'm kind of a weirdo, so whatever. If if I'm if if you wake up and see I'm the only person that's hashtag UFC China. You know what's up. See, that's the difference between the West Coast and the Third Coast, because you say stay up, and I say wake up. <laughs> I'm just going to set my alarm for like 3.30 in the morning and brew a giant pot of coffee. <laughs> all right, so um, all right, now we're going to move on to the buried lead. Buried lead it will be a story that you think should be getting more coverage, or you probably just think people kind of missed in, in the shuffle, so... Pat, I'm going to start with you. What's your buried lead for the week? Uh, so my buried lead, that it's, it's getting a little bit of coverage now, but I think it should have more attention, is uh, this week is the um, very important, a, a big section of the most important parts of the UFC antitrust hearing. Uh, and already today, the judge has decided that the um, experts' reports from both the UFC and the plaintiffs are going to be unsealed. Nothing is going to be redacted. So... All the financials and all the percentages right now that are redacted are about to be wide open to the public. It's going to be pretty nuts. I thought it was already the tidbit I learned for today is that Floyd Mayweather made more money than all of the UFC fighters combined between 2010 and 2017. So that's an interesting little little nugget of information, and that includes like every single fighter. So McGregor, Rousey, all of those people are in that. Um, Brock Lesnar's almost entire UFC career. He had like one or two fights before 2010. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's nuts. So I think that should be getting more attention because the amount of info in there is nuts. 
So no oh, man. All right, uh, Ben, what's your buried lead for the week? Honestly, I mean, Pat has already destroyed this topic because this should be the only thing we're talking about this week. Like the fact that we're finding out what fighter pay is as a percentage of UFC revenue, at least in the ballpark figure, is nuts. Uh, so. As a, a very much a sideshow to that, uh, I noticed that the uh, Matt Brown versus Ben Saunders fight was announced. This is a fight, I mean, of all the fights that have ever been made in MMA past their expiration date, this is on the short list. I mean, Ben Saunders peaked kind of early-ish. 2007 to 2009, he was spectacular. He looked like a guy you knew he probably wasn't ever going to be the champ as long as like people like George St. Pierre and Josh Kostek and John Fitch were at the top. But he just did spectacular stuff. He was a nasty dude that act- did actual Muay Thai stuff on people in the cage. Like it, He was an exciting dude, and he peaked and he, and he kind of went away. Matt Brown was a late bloomer. You know, he went from just kind of another kind of rednecky guy from Tough to the terror of the welterweight division and coming within a single fight of a title shot in like 2013, even though they're about the same age. They're finally fighting. It's well past the expiration date for both of them. And for Brown in particular, you know, it's it's kind of worrisome, but it's happening. And that that's kind of my buried lead. You know, this is a fight I wish had happened at some other point. And... For Matt Brown, I'm particularly bummed for myself because this bumps back his induction to the Hall of Fucking Awesome by at least another year. Uh, Mm -hmm. As a a bit of brief self-promotion, the reason I'm here at SureDog is for the Hall of Fucking Awesome. Yes. The the Hall of Fucking Awesome is an institution. Which which enshrines fighters who, while they may not be first ballot inductees for a traditional Hall of Fame, although a couple of them are, uh, were fucking awesome and deserve to be remembered. And one of the requirements, we don't say retirement because nobody retires in MMA. They just keep coming back until they die. But it has to be a year from their last fight, and Matt Brown just booked another fight. So I hope it ends in a 36-second guillotine choke win for one guy or the other so that nobody takes any more brain damage and they can get back into the queue to be enshrined. And you're really going to hate the rematch of that in Bellator, man. (laughs) I want you to shut your whore mouth right now. (laughs) Another notable uh, thing here. Ben Saunders, I believe, is the only uh, UFC fighter to be credited as a practitioner of Jeet Kune Do. So uh, that's just... And plenty of them cropped up here and there. Like, guys love to drop that little thing, you know, and say they're a Jeet Kune Do. But, like, he might be the only one right now. Yeah, I think he is. All right, um, Jose, what is your buried lead for the week? Yeah, what in the world was Helen Mirren doing at Combate Americas? That caught me off guard. Like, yes, oh my, I said the same thing. What the hell? Helen, I, all of a sudden, I'm sitting there. I'm on, like, I'm doing some work, and I get an email from Combate, and it was like Academy Award winner, Golden Globe winning actress Helen Mirren sits cage or sits cage side at Combate Americas. I'm like, why? And then I <laughs> and she's like smoozing with Tito Ortiz, posing with the belt. And I'm just like, you know what? Good for you, Combate Americas. As a proud Hispanic man who's been loved with a love of MMA, I really want them to succeed. That's an untapped market with a lot of potential. But uh, if you would have told me, take a guess which Academy Award winning actor actress was sitting cage side at Combate Americas and Tito Ortiz, I, w- I guarantee you Helen Mirren would be way down at the bottom. So uh, it is truly a baffling development in my life and the MMA world. Uh, so 2019 is truly, truly a year of mystery and wonder for me because I did not see that coming. <laughs> All right, so Jose, quickly, man, who is um, who would be the first Academy Award winner that you'd expect to be sitting cage side? For Combate? Hmm... Probably someone like Casey Affleck. Okay. See, all of you guys are like, yeah, I can like, see that. that yeah, that's not a bad one. Yeah. Yeah, Casey I, Affleck, not even sure where he is. Right. <laughs> Pops up in Compache America, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so uh, my buried lead for the week uh, related to uh, the UFC China event, uh, because, of course, there's a lot of political turmoil in China near where the event site is i want to say this is only like 20 miles away or something like that where they're holding the event from like the hong kong protest but because of that and i'm no i'm going to butcher his name so i apologize in in advance 
but a, a MMA fighter who is known for debunking the uh, no-touch martial arts guys, um, the, the series of clowns that, that claim to be martial artists. Um, his name is uh, Zo, Zo Dong, I think his name is. Um, but he has been uh, questioned by the Chinese government because he has come out in support of the the Hong Kong protesters, and in fact, the 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 statement that he put out, it didn't even seem like it was it was full on support, like endorsing the protest, but more like an expression of sympathy for the people and their grievances. But anyway, he's been questioned by the Chinese government, and his social credit score has dropped as as a result, which means that he has uh, less rights to like good housing and uh, his family gets affected by the t sort of jobs that they can have and whatnot. So it's a pretty sc screwed up situation, but that is the backdrop of the UFC's event in China this weekend. So um, yeah, I hope they got those tattoos covered up. So uh, that's that. Now that will conclude off the chain for this week. But before we go, we got to let these good folks know where they can find us all on social media. So before I screw this up, Mr. Patrick OJ, please, please be first. Tell everyone where they can find you. Although they've probably heard it about four times already. Because it's the oh, yeah. only reason we invited your ass back. <laughs> Fair enough. It's free, free publicity, man. Uh, so you can find me at All Day OJ. OJ is spelled A U G E R uh, on Twitter or Instagram, although I'm never on Instagram. Really, just Twitter. Just, yeah, sure. You just go there. That, that works. Or sure, don't. <laughs> See me right. Sure. Don't. <laughs> and unfollow and follow me that's the key thing so all right. well we're gonna edit that part out uh ben uh where can the good folks find you you can find me on twitter at at benjamin duffy i i don't append mma to my name because if you don't know that i'm that benjamin duffy then i need to get more famous than the other ones apparently <laughs> and most importantly <laughs> you can find me here on this show on tuesday afternoons all right. And to our special guest, Jose Youngs of MMA Fighting, where can the good folks find you? Um, I know you got uh, A-Side live chat coming up uh, Wednesday as well, tomorrow when Wednesday, people see this. Wednesday, Wednesday, 10 a.m. to Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. We do a live from the little site called MMAfighting.com. You can find us at MMA Fighting or at MMA Fighting D-O-T-C-O-M on Instagram. And for me, I believe I'm the only Jose Youngs on planet Earth. So if there's another one, contact me because we need to talk and we need to meet. So you need to fight, but, fight to the death, <laughs> yeah. fight to the death. There can be only one. Nah, because for all I know, he's just a, he. Nah, because I'm not trying to get embarrassed because then I lose my name. As, just as, as as I wouldn't feel comfortable being the only being another Jose Youngs if I knew he could kick my ass. So <laughs> Youngs at J O C Y U N G S. That's my only handle across all platforms. So come make fun of me, just like everyone else does. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't make fun of you, Jose. I like you. All right. Um, I am Ant Walker. You can follow me on Twitter at Ant Walker MMA. You can find my work on Shirtout.com and MMA on Point. Uh, got the Trenches live chat coming up uh, Wednesday evening with the homie Jason Burgo. So be sure to check that out. And um, yeah, I think that's all that we got coming out uh, this week. So you know what you got to do. You must stay beautiful. You must stay positive. And no matter how big your, your social credit score drops, you got to stay sexy. I will see you when I see you. Peace.